You know, our Bloomberg Intelligence technology expert, Matthew Bloxham, was telling us that this could be one of the companies that's really uh, leading the technology resurgence in Europe, taking advantage of the 5G um, revolution. How, how, how much of an improvement do you see as a possibility for the shares? Because clearly Nokia is just a sliver of what it once was 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, thank you, Matt. But, uh, of course, that was a different business with mobile phones. Uh, you know, I, I think on 5G, we are winning more and more 5G deals. We now have 83 5G deals, both in uh, the service provider space, but also enterprise. We've launched 32 live networks. Today we've seen uh, better than expected profitability. Gas generation showed significant improvements. Uh, clear indications of a strength to uh, in mobile radio. And, of course, uh, enterprise continues to show strong growth and robust margins. And so this gave us confidence to improve our guidance for the full year in EPS as well as uh, operating margin and upgrade our, our free cash flow forecast as well. Rajiv, Amory in London here. Good morning. On the 5G market, you've been aiming for about 25 percent 4G, 5G share. Will you make up for that? And if you do, is it because of the pushback and how the West um, – is pretty much blocking out Huawei. Uh, thanks, Emery. No, we've uh, we said up above 27 percent. So we we see that uh, this year we can end our 4G and 5G market share to be uh, you know 27 percent. Uh, our 5G win rate. So that is a measure of you know what is the percentage of customers we are moving from 4G to 5G. Uh, adjusted for size, and that remains uh, over 100 percent, excluding China. On your question, uh, you know, we've been watching geopolitical trends. Uh, we're watching the situation closely. And uh, unlike what we have seen before, we are now seeing concrete midterm opportunities emerging. And uh, we've won some deals uh, in that space uh, because of those trends. And as both develop further, I think we're uh, well positioned in terms of both product capability and capacity. You've made fewer sales. Um, then, then your Nordic rival Ericsson in China could that be an advantage if China fights back on the Huawei bans with its own, you know, bans on Western suppliers? Yeah, we have business in China as well. We're a uh, you know strong player in China. Uh, we're adjusting our mix in China, uh, but you know we're very clear uh, that we will uh, optimize for profitability and cash. Uh, and uh, also for features that are required globally as opposed to some markets that need, you know, customization. And that strategy is playing out well. We've seen our gross margin return to 40 percent. Our 5G win rate uh, is robust. And only that, we are uh, – this focus is allowing us to lead in globally available next-generation solutions such as, you know, VRAN, virtualized RAN, cloud RAN, and open RAN. So I think focus uh, in where you want to win – allows you to, to uh, you know, benefit in next-generation technologies uh, as well. Just picking up there on China, Rajiv, this year has really showed us about the geopolitical tensions playing out in the world, especially between Beijing and Washington, as well as between Westminster and Beijing. Is the world headed for this bifurcated tech system, East versus West? And what does that really mean for tech companies? Of course, uh, you know, there's a risk of that, and you, you want to watch geopolitical trends uh, very carefully. You want to choose the battles uh, and the markets and the regions you want to win in. You also want to make sure that as a global company operating in a multitude of countries and regions that, you know, we're mindful of the geopolitical environment, uh, both on the risks and opportunities that it creates for us. I just mentioned the opportunities that we're seeing concrete midterm opportunities emerging. Uh, at the same time, we have to be uh, watching our global supply chain footprint, uh, and luckily that is designed for optimized global supply so we can mitigate against any risks and local disruptive events. And to be honest, I mean, over the last couple of years, first with the trade wars and then this year with the pandemic, uh, our supply chain has had to be super agile, and uh, we've done well so far. Today is your last day on the job. I wonder what advice you have for your successor. What do you what do you what do you want to pass on that you've learned over your long career? Uh, I would say a few things. 
it's a it's a tough industry. Operational discipline is a must at all times. Uh, the importance of diversification and growth; these are linked. You know, we've uh, during my time here, we have diversified into enterprise very successfully, as well as standalone software. Uh, importance of our values, right? We believe in openness, equality, fairness, and uh, we want to lead with ethical leadership in a challenging industry. And actually, the importance of Nokia's people, because whatever success I've had over the past decade in in consolidating the industry to be a healthier one, you know, it's been done with uh, uh, colleagues and people, uh, both past and present. And we've invented, made, sold some genuinely breathtaking products and services, but always done so while acting in an honorable, ethical way. Naturally, Pekka will bring his own impressions, his outside in perspective. And you know what? We've had a very long transition here, five months since we announced uh, on the 2nd of March that I'm departing. And I'm still around here. I stepped down uh, later tonight, but then I will be there as an advisor to the Nokia board to help this transition. So if you ask me how's the transition gone, I have one word, orderly.